Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Space Analytics for a Cost-Efficient, Enjoyable Workplace. My name is Ari Kepnes. Uh, I am Director of Market Research here at Density, and I'm joined today by Rob. Rob is a co-founder of Density uh, and has been heading product for us. Um, so today we are going to talk a little about who we are here at Density. And we're going to talk about space analytics and how a data-driven approach to uh, space performance is a way of actually um, driving improvements, both in terms of efficiency and enjoyment across your workplace. And then we're going to do a demo of the um, framework that I'm presenting with our the product, the analytics, and then we're going to take your questions. So at the top of the bottom of your screen, you should see a little Q&A folder, Q plus A, and you can leave questions as we're going. Um, and please feel free to leave your name or do so anonymously. Um, and as you were going, we want to be a resource for you. So um, please feel free to leave as many questions as possible. So a little bit about us. We're a company called Density, uh, and we were founded in 2014 um, to really improve the efficiency, security, and experience of buildings in real estate. We work with um, clients who have a large amount of real estate, which I'll talk about in one moment. Um, we are based in the U.S. and San Francisco, and we have a manufacturing facility in, in Syracuse. A little fun facts about us. Now, we have been building for the past um, few years now uh, the most advanced people counting sensor. So that's a framework for thinking about density is how do you actually collect data on how spaces are used so that you can then um, have a better space. And we do that with the most advanced people counting sensor. It's not a camera, but as you can see there, that's the device. It goes above a doorway and it's constantly tracking in real time entrances and exits. So as people are entering and exiting a space, it's able to across all the different doorways um, for floors, buildings, and rooms track how are those spaces used. And it does so in a way that is anonymous. So it doesn't have any privacy issues in real time and accurate. So um, we're going to talk about the uh, analytics that you can get from this type of sensor platform. Here's some of the customers that we work with. We work with many, uh, and they have one thing in common, even though they come from a lot of different um, parts of industry, in that they all have a large amount of real estate. So they need to drive both efficiency and have large workplaces or serve large occupant bases that they need to have a good experience. So. Let's start off with this overall question. You know, a lot of the themes that went out when we were promoting this webinar, we wanted to help you understand how do you actually justify some of your spending and how do you take a data-driven approach? So it comes down to a couple of things. Why do you want to analyze how people use space? Well, number one, if you care about the end user, the occupants, um, you want to know, well, how are they actually using the space and make sure that it's suiting their certain needs. So an effective space is one that puts the occupants first. Um, the other thing is that you need to be able to plan. So real estate projects are very expensive. They're only going up in costs, both in terms of managing and renting and buying real estate. So to be able to make different decisions, plan ahead for workplace specifically with changes in headcount, you need to have data on how are those current assets being used and really understand what is effective. And then we also have this idea of reducing costs. So in general with real estate, there's this shift towards managing real estate to drive the most efficiency as possible. Well, if you wanna do that, you need to understand, well, how are my spaces being used? How are they performing? And where are the places that are underperforming or unused or empty? And where can we make different decisions? Or where's the space just not doing what we thought it would do? So those are some of the three different um, ways of thinking about the advantages or high level value propositions for analyzing space. Now, of course, when you're having conversations internally with like your CFO, um, or in some cases, any, anyone who's involved with some of these large real estate decisions, space planners, um, real estate, they're all going to want to know, well, how do we balance the occupant experience, make sure everyone's happy and getting what they need. And we're not just throwing away dollars. So there's this balancing act and you need data to do that. And we've seen that happen in the digital world but it's really just coming now to fruition in the physical space um, that we think of as workplaces and large real estate. So here are some of the things that you can do. I'm gonna introduce this idea of space analytics. On the right, this is just a screenshot of one of um, uh, our um, different uh, platforms for space analytics. 
But here's some of the things that you can do once you have the data to do it. Well, you can repurpose or consolidate space. So how do you do that? Well, once you have space analytics, you can compare and identify your best and worst performing spaces. And Rob's gonna show us this in just one moment. You can quantify the total cost of underutilized space and make objective recommendations. You take the guesswork and politics out of space planning, out of um, some of these large decisions. And then you can really repurpose and be strategic um, or if you can't be repurposed because your lease is too, too kind of far in, then you can still make changes on the interior level. So we're really trying to um, really understand the future of using data to change how physical worlds uh, are and built environments are, are kind of um, being managed. And this is one tool to do that. So, so far I've established why you want to measure people in space and some of the high level value propositions and reasons why. And then I've now dived into some of the ways and actions and decisions that you can make. The other thing that's really important, and this is something that we're seeing with um, our large Fortune 500 clients especially, is that they want to create standards for efficient growth. So they don't want to just have a space um, or workplace, let's say an office building, and then do all this work to make it great, and then that's it. They think about their portfolio as a whole, and they start to develop ratios of things like how many meeting rooms do we need? How much square footage do we need per person? Can we actually think about new strategies like hoteling? Do we have any data that's helping us support things like co-working? So there's this shift in a lot of the, the people that we're talking to that are trying to create standards for efficient growth and they're collecting data to do so. So you can see here um, that once you actually monitor and measure actual utilization rates, now I've used how people use space, but we're gonna talk more formally about this idea of actual utilization rates, you can do things like know how many people per head you need, know how many people you can fit, help with reorgs. People are always moving um, in different spaces, so you wanna be able to say, okay, this team is needing this, they need this many desks, and you can support those things. But you can only do that once you have baselines and then some of these efficient standards. So I've talked pretty abstractly about some of the high-level value props, so I'm gonna now turn it over to Rob, and he's gonna talk through um, these three examples of how do these frameworks apply to conference rooms, which is a huge topic in the world of collaboration and a world of remote work and video conferencing, desk use, so things like neighborhoods and desks, and overall building occupancy with large amenity spaces like cafes. So Rob, um, thanks for tuning in with us, and can you uh, share some of your work with analytics? Absolutely. Thanks, Ari. <clears throat> so as Ari mentioned, I'm just kind of going to go through uh, three examples um, that, that some of our customers use this specific tool for, which are starting at the low conference room level and working our way up to like portfolio level metrics. Uh, so this is our analytics tool. Um, you can save reports and revisit them later over any time frame. And we also uh, give you a, a list of recommended reports based on uh, the nature of your portfolio. So in this case, we're dealing with an office space and we just automatically generate like an office summary, conference room summaries and so on. Um, so I'm going to start with the conference rooms. <clears throat> um, in, in this particular example, we have three rooms of, of different sizes. And I think, as Ari mentioned, what you're really trying to do is right size the space to ensure that your employees uh, have the resources that they need. In this particular example, you can see um, there's, there's a particular space that uh, is designed for six people, but is sort of peeking out. And in general, these conference rooms are being used a lot throughout the day. Um, you, you may not always want to look at the last week, so we have some variability. You can look at the last month um, or, the, or the last, oh, sorry, you look at the last month um, and get a, get a broader data set to get a more complete picture of what's going on. Um, and uh, yeah, again, in this, in this case, some, what some of our customers might, might like to do is, is divvy up these spaces more appropriately to ensure that they're right size for their, uh, for their employees. Um, or just reallocate teams or maybe change the nature of the space. Maybe these need to actually just be team rooms so that these spaces, these, these teams have a place to huddle and collaborate. Um, in the case of neighborhoods. Hey Rob, I'm just gonna, uh, can you go yeah. back to conference rooms? I just wanna chime in here. Absolutely. So if I'm looking at this for the first time, I may be intimidated by all these different um, rooms and charts. I just wanna break it down one level of abstraction, which is you know, when you're building out a space and especially creating standards, there's things like um, how many conference rooms do we need and how many conference rooms should we have per employee. So for example, one, one of our clients was, was looking at what they found was that for every seven employees that are in an open desk, they wanted some sort of closed door. They, they realized that they needed 
um, some space for people to go. Now there's ratios of that, let's say, then they needed to find out, well, how many conference rooms do we need and what size should they be? So they use some of this data to say, okay, well, we're gonna group, we're gonna group together all of the conference rooms that are of a certain capacity and we're gonna track their use over time. And then we can actually compare them and see how are they actually being used versus their capacity. And one thing that we found with them specifically is with 33% of the time, the large conference rooms were made for 12 people were actually being used just by one person. So they used that data, they added phone booths, and then they were able to see huge, um, huge amount of shift in terms of the usage. So what is this all showing us is that you can actually drive some of those decisions and make the space planning decisions you need and the interior um, when you're talking about workplaces. So I just want to provide some color and I'll do so along the way too, Rob. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. That, that's, that's great, Ari. Um, so moving sort of up, up to that next level beyond your specific conference room resources, you may have some open seating, which I think everyone knows is an is a, is a, uh, increasing trend and um, allows for certain, certain efficiencies in an office space. There are also problems, but we won't get into that uh, today. And in, in this scenario, we have three neighborhoods. So one assigned to a marketing team, one assigned to sale team, and one mixed. Um, and, and again, a lot, of, a lot of companies do this to sort of increase collaboration, sort of uh, create more serendipity uh, in, in, in a cross-functional organization. Uh, on the surface, it looks like all these are being used uh, in a similar way or, or one might assume appropriately, but we have several different metri metrics here. One of those is utilization, which actually looks at uh, the, the amount of space, the amount of uh, people the space was designed to hold and how many people are actually using that space. In this example, the, the sales team is not necessarily in that space all the time, all day. That's something you, that, that's sort of typical to, to a sales team where they're more transient and, and perhaps having more meetings. Um, so this, you could use this data as sort of a signal to suggest that, hey, your sales team might have different needs than you may have initially planned for, um, and you can make the appro appropriate adjustments. Right. So, so Rob, in this chart here, we see in the capacity, we see that the sales is twice the capacity of the other teams in terms of the allocation of space, meaning it can hold 80 people, but the right. same amount, only 40 people are actually using that space. So even though the occupancy yep. was also at 40, um, it was actually way underutilized. And what we found with this client too, just to chime in here, was that they weren't at their desks. Um, but they were way over utilizing the um, or, or using more than any other team all of the conference rooms so that they could bring in specifically the nice ones so they could bring in um, their potential prospects and have business meetings in those rooms. So the client took some of this data. They actually found out that they, they should overinvest in the meeting rooms because those were client facing rooms that they didn't know before looking at the data and then they could rearrange and really resolve some of these conflicts over how do you utilize how do you allocate the right amount of, of desks now one thing i'll just chime in too is that a lot of clients look at this and they immediately want to say great we're going to make desks smaller give less square feet per person and we're also going to move to not even assign desks and what happens is those decisions when they're not done in a real thoughtful way with data then you get a lot of backlash. And so you have to be able to take some of the data, understand the certain needs, see where people are going throughout the day besides just a one snapshot of one place. And that's why we have all of these different types of analytics tools. So sorry to interrupt there. No, no, this is, this is really great. Um, one, thing, one additional thing I wanted to point out is just the ability to, to scope by time of day. So you'll notice here, Saturdays and Sundays, at the office is pretty quiet. This is probably cleaning crew or something like that. Uh, you can actually filter filter these results, sort of get rid of the time periods that uh, perhaps are less busy and get a more uh, detailed picture of what's going on. <clears throat> cool. So then lastly, uh, we'll take that, that next jump up and sort of look at billing level stuff. Again, in this, example, is it, in this example, we're measuring the total occupancy of a building. And then this particular uh, customer offers cafe services in this building. Um, so we can get a look for overall occupancy and then at any point in time see the breakdown of the resources within it. So in, 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 this, in this case, um, this particular building has 169 people and you know at, 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 at this particular time, 87 of those people are actually in the cafeteria itself. Um, and again, this is really all about these big large investments and ensuring that you're offering your, your patrons uh, a service efficiently that's not sort of breaking, breaking the bank. And there's one way we can make that really easily, excuse me, <clears throat> 
It's one way we make that really easy with our, our, our new available capacity metric, um, which actually exposes the real dollar amounts uh, per patron. So you're able to customize the, the cost per head or cost per person, or let's say you're, you're in a co-working space, you could do the cost per desk. Uh, you, can, you can change this value to uh, something that, that applies broadly, and you'll actually get the potential savings on a monthly basis um, based on based on your usage. Yeah, can um, you, so, so Rob, can you yeah, go, go to the actual uh, the the neighborhood section for a second? Back sure, to that, absolutely. Yeah, because one thing that we and one thing that we've used this for is the capacity for this. So if you were to put in there, I know yep. on the left you can now select all these different metrics. So what happens when you select it here? <clears throat> yeah, so went through and selected that there, um, and yeah, again you can just sort of see the the overall effect here. So at at its at its highest point, essentially, the sales neighborhood uh, has about 80 people that it, that you could sort of toss into that neighborhood without seeing any negative impact or without going over capacity. And again, if you're tracking dollar amounts per people, ultimately, you can quantify that information. And that, that becomes a really valid argument when, when speaking with your team or reporting on, on an overall investment. Um, I also want to add, you can very easily export all this data. You can either export the time series data and, and do more advanced calculations yourself, or just export the summary here in the table, just downloads a nice simple CSV for you and you can include that in your reporting elsewhere. All right, anything else on, on some of these metrics or reports? I don't think so. I just wanted to kind of make it clear that, you know, what the steps are doing. So you're defining the metric on the left, yes. right? Then you, and you may have different metrics for different needs, and different problems you're yep. trying to solve then you're going in and, and choosing, can you just click on that, the different space so you can click, all right, so I, let's say I wanna compare all my conference rooms or all my offices or, or just a specific right. location, right? And then you're going in and being able to change the time scale and granularity, is that right? That's exactly right, yep, and in, in that order. Um, and again, the, the, the metrics you choose and the timeframes you choose are definitely gonna be based on uh, your, your problem. Um, but, you know, we offer a, a suite of metrics and, and a lot of flexibility in the time ranges you can query, as well as the interval at which you can query them for. So we offer uh, daily values, hourly values, all the way down to 15 minutes in granularity. Great. Well, thank you for that. I'm actually going to just take over the screen now. Yep. Okay. So just to kind of put this into thinking about your own organization, having conversations, here are some of the, the three high level things that we were doing that really get to what are people's main jobs to be done in their organizations and how they can use data to do it. So the first is that you're unlocking savings without sacrificing occupant experience. I've said that at the beginning that, that both of those things were important. And the only way to do that is to really get a granular sense of how much square feet you actually use and then have some of those standards or to be able to see, okay, for example, with the neighborhoods that we're looking at with the different teams, what are some of the actual needs and how does that translate into desk use or meeting room use? Then the second thing we're doing is we're looking at the best and worst performing spaces. So we were able to say, you know, what is going to have a anomaly? What is going to be an anomaly once we look at the baseline? And so it may be things like buildings or rooms, floors. We've had clients being able to kind of change their whole floor uh, or even choose how to change the lease based on buildings just by, by kind of thinking about it comparatively. And then the second is ongoing data. So Rob, in all of his examples, he had a different time scale. Um, and so what we're finding is it's not okay anymore to just do like a utilization study where people come in with clipboards and they come in for a couple of times and then that's it. You need ongoing data to be able to understand how different teams are using it as you're fluctuating in headcount. Um, how is that changing some of the usage patterns? So we're seeing really this analytics 2.0, so to speak, in terms of understanding what performance is, quantifying it, and then making some of the strategic decisions. So it's a really cool and exciting time. Um, now, when we look at um, one step below that, how are we actually collecting the data? And why, why do we believe that you know, our approach to this is something that's gonna be able to, to get at that, that kind of panoptica, that holy grail of both an efficient and an enjoyable space? Well it's because the, we're collecting this data in a way that is very accurate in real time. So for each of those charts, that's millions of data points of second by second, how many people are in the space? And we're sorting that by the room and, and the 
there's a lot of complexity that goes into just making a simple suggestion. So our approach, the reason why we believe we have this competitive advantage, just to speak to that, because it's very confusing in the world of sensors, is that we have an accurate anonymous people counting device, device and we're using machine learning to actually track on the right. You can see there discerning with a machine what is a human, what isn't, as they go through that threshold. And then the second uh, thing that we really care about um, is that we want to make sure that it can fit in the actual workplace environment. So this is an example with from Pepsi where they put us in this room here and you can see it works very well. Um, but we want to be able to be installed with in the building level, um, in the conference room level, training rooms. And that's an important part when you're getting a comprehensive look. Um, then the other thing to keep in mind, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can be successful with once you get this data, but getting the data um, is not always something that um, clients do before they come to us. So a lot of times they'll go and they'll, they put in either seat sensors, brake beams, cameras, and then there's privacy issues. So our approach is really around the privacy, um, security, um, so and having the accurate data that's always available in a lot of different formats. So when you're thinking about how do I get on this train of sensorification, big data, I want to do so in a way that's going to um, be fitting with my organization. These are some of the things that we keep in mind. We have a lot of resources for this. So if you have any questions, um, please reach out. On that note, we do have some questions. Um, it looks like um, one, one question we have first is um, that someone wants to know about how do we actually um, track um, the people for, for different spaces and how do we ensure um, that we're actually doing that accurately and not counting people twice? So what's interesting is that um, humans have heads and shoulders and we can't be at the same place at the same time. Uh, so our technology is built around that. So it's constantly scanning heads and shoulders. And so what we can do is, let's say you go to your for first floor, you go to your desk. We know that there's, we don't know who you are, but we know that one person is, is kind of at their desk in the floor area. But then we see that there's actually um, a shift towards over the course of the day, there's people in the conference room or there's people in the cafeteria. So when you look at an aggregate level, because you know how many people are in the building or on the floor, then you can start to track um, traffic over the course of the day. Um, and so that's really impactful for understanding some of these um, design and space efficiency decisions. Um, and then I do want to, there. Uh, I want to look at this question here. Uh, again, it's about privacy. So um, how do you deal with privacy? Um, more specifically, what's the difference between you and cameras? Okay, so so the, the thing to note is that we are using depth um, to scan. So it's almost like a topographical image or it's or an echo location, but with, with light that you can't see. And it's being able to discern what are those shapes and valleys. And it can say, okay, that's a human footprint um, and that is as one human entering and exiting the space versus a camera is an optical sensor. So it's taking in that data and looking at the differences in pixel um, and saying, okay, that looks like a human, which has a lot of accuracy issues and privacy issues. So we've developed this from the ground up. We've actually developed our own hardware. Um, and now we're talking about the software. So those two things go hand in hand. Um, all right. What parts of an organization seem to be most open to using IoT devices? Um, so that's a great question because we've talked a lot about the end uses and the data. And there's a couple things to consider. Number one is data fluency and just comfort of using IoT devices in different organizations. Different organizations have different tolerance for it. What we found is that security teams, um, they're, they're used to installing some sort of uh, network device and doing so in a way that obviously is secure because that's their job. Um, IT, those are people who are great to get involved early as you're thinking through these. Um, and as high up in the organization as you can go and get buy-in, the better. So when you're thinking about, okay, you're overwhelmed by sensors, you're trying to make all these decisions, should you go to co-working, should, to, um, should you go to flex space, and you want data, you want to be a hero internally, you need to be able to recruit some different people to help you and be in your court so that it's not in a silo. And that's where we've seen that work the best. Um, great. Is it possible to monitor occupancy of an entire space or building with multiple access entrance and exits available at the same time? Great question. 
um, thank you very much. And the answer is yes. So the devices can be in, are installed. Let's say let's say this conference room that I'm in now had two doors. There would be two sensors above each door, and they would automatically calibrate. So they would automatically be able to discern that both of those entries and exits have to do with just this room. So there wouldn't be a double counting or anything like that. Um, same thing with um, on a floor level. You have a floor of people coming into the space. Those are tracking um, how many people are entering, and then those work in tandem in the back end instantaneously. When I say real time, I mean less than 400 milliseconds to know how many people are in which part of the space. Um, great, great question. How can I automate an analytics report to email to a colleague who doesn't have their own density login? Great question. Um, and again, we're working with a world in which all of this stuff is new. Um, most people feel overwhelmed and they don't want another tool that they have to have a learning curve. So I want to make sure that you understand uh, or that we all understand that that is the world in which this lives and we have to collectively make things easy. So as Rob was showing, um, you can actually save and export um, uh, in, in different file formats. And he mentioned Excel, um, which is um, an easy CSV, or you can do so in an actual automated report. So we're seeing that the email tool is actually one of the best change management tools because you get an email digest. It says, here's how it's tracking over the past six months or this week, whatever it is. And then you can just forward that along high up in the organization. And it's that email digest, which is so important. And a lot of people forget when they're building hardware and fun dashboards that at the end of the day, yes, uh, you have to be able to have a good email solution. And, and that's our approach. It's been good. We also have, can do weekly summaries with the civics analytics and other tools that we have. Cool. So thank you so much for your time. We're just getting to 30 minutes past the hour and I really appreciate your time. Again, we're kind of in this wild, wild west of a world where people are trying to figure out what is buzz, what's actually going to be effective. They're burned before with some things. And so, you know, we get it, we empathize and we want to help. So please feel free to reach out to me personally um, or to density at um, this email here, sales at density.io. Thanks so much and have a good day.